Welcome to Imperfect Heart, a place for you to join me, Jeff Holden, in conversations, discussions, and dialogue about our hearts and the impact myocardial bridges have on them. We'll talk with healthcare professionals, those in related fields that support our condition, and others just like us with stories of their myocardial bridge experiences. It's my intention for this content to inform, educate, entertain, and even motivate or inspire you in your personal journey on dealing with a myocardial bridge. Most importantly is to have you leave each episode with hope, knowing you're not alone and that what you're experiencing is real. If you would have asked me nine months ago when I started this podcast where I thought our conversations with doctors or those with bridges would originate, I would have most certainly said the United States. I never would have imagined I would be speaking with unroofed patients around the globe, and I certainly would not have expected to have had the opportunity to speak with one of the leading cardiothoracic vascular surgeons in Europe, or Singapore for that matter. I guess that gives you a hint as to who my guest is today if you're active on the Facebook page. It's none other than the professor who gave us nearly two hours of his time on a Sunday for an interactive Facebook Live presentation. Yes, Professor Theo Kofidis, head of the Department of Cardio, Thoracic, and Vascular Surgery at the National University Hospital of Singapore, senior consultant cardiothoracic surgeon, an expert in minimally invasive heart surgery, and an avid researcher. He's a renowned cardiac surgeon and strongly sought for proctor and surgical teacher around the world, one of only a very few American Association of Thoracic Surgery members in Southeast Asia. He's also an ambassador for the steering committee of the World Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery for the same region. He's founder and owner of the company Cardia PTE Limited, aiming at the development of disruptive heart valve and minimally invasive heart surgery technology. He's chairman of Initiative for Research and Innovation in Surgery, has introduced various new technologies and launched new types of less invasive surgery, and over the last 12 years in Singapore, has established the most complete pioneering and advanced minimally invasive and endoscopic heart surgery program in the region. He's also set up the most advanced hemodynamic research laboratory and cardiovascular surgical research group in Singapore. Professor Kerfidis has trained in some of the world's leading institutions, including Rochester, New York, Texas Heart in Houston, Hanover, Germany, and one we're most familiar with, Stanford, California. He's decorated with various international awards and carries various offices and commitments internationally. He has lectured for the American Medical Association, the FDA, the Bill Gates Research Institute, and more. As an academic teacher, proctor, and consultant for a number of companies, he is holding events and workshops in various countries around the world, bringing minimally invasive know-how to doctors and patients alike. He resides in Singapore with his wife and daughter, has a passion for flying airplanes, and enjoys photography, exercising, and reading. Wow. Professor Kofidis, I can't wait to get this conversation started. Welcome to Imperfect Heart. Good to be here, Jeff. Uh, happy to meet the audience as well. You happen to have the distinction of being my first international guest. So we've never had anybody outside of our United States time zones I know it's nine o'clock here. What time is it in Singapore? Well, it's 12 noon the next day. We have 15 hours of difference. Singapore is ahead. Wonderful. You know, one of the things that we see from the Facebook group, and, and thank you so much for the participation on that Zoom session that you did for everybody that participated with you. Uh, Europe seems to be slower in acceptance of myocardial bridges and certainly the subsequent surgery process or surgical process to repair a bridge. Why might that be the case? Well, first of all, there is this global phenomenon of the myocardial bridge not uh, being duly recognized and acknowledged as a disease entity. There is a lot of confusion. And we must also remember that Europe is not one thing, one healthcare system. It's like 35 or 40 different healthcare systems. There is no continuity or uh, common uh, philosophy on all kinds of diseases. Uh, myocardial bridge mean, being more or less at the edge of this spectrum uh, is not really duly recognized oftentimes. Um, the other reason may be that every country has its own healthcare coverage as well as medical legal system. And there are quite a few countries in Europe 
where doctors, out of fear of failure or fear of, of uh, medical legal persecution, exercise defensive medicine or defensive surgery. Mm-hmm. Myocardial bridge being a not so well recognized uh, entity, uh, many surgeons will think twice before they go into something like in the gray zone as myocardial bridges. That's how they may view it. And that would be the best uh, uh, you know, um, answer I would imagine uh, addresses your question. It does. And I saw in your training that you spent a fair amount of time in the United States at some phenomenal hospitals, including Stanford and Texas Heart. Did, do you think that gave you a little bit different perspective, taking it back to Europe and Singapore? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, uh, that was in my earlier years, my formative years as a scientist and surgeon, so to speak. And definitely the United States has uh, impacted the way I think. Um, you know, uh, the way I strive for the best possible outcome for the patient and innovation. So uh, the open-mindedness, the grandeur of, uh, you know, the hospitals I had the privilege to train helped me think big and pursue my goals with uh, the utmost uh, um, dedication. That's pretty much American, I would say, and that stained me in a good sense for the rest of my life. Let me ask, obviously, you're Greek yeah. and Greece is home. Why Singapore? How do you how do you tie those two together? That's a very good question. And I'll keep my biographical part uh, short. In a nutshell, <laughs> I left Greece when I was 18 years old, born and raised in Greece. That's where they say home is where mama is. So mama is in Greece, definitely. So I then went to Germany, um, I did my uh, medical studies in Germany. I did my internship in uh, Rochester, New York and uh, Texas Heart, as you mentioned. Then back to Germany for the main specialty training. And then I got an award which uh, financed my training in Stanford uh, as well as my research. So um, this done, I had to go back to Germany to get my PhD defended. So I defended my thesis, finished it and out of nowhere, I had an offer from Singapore. I found myself at a dinner with a very significant Singaporean leader around the table who got very interested in my uh, pursuit of, uh, you know, innovation, research, but mainly minimal invasive and endoscopic heart surgery at that time. So he invited me for a lecture in Singapore and the rest is history. You know, one of the things that you just mentioned there with the minimally invasive uh, is, is a very hot topic with the Facebook group, and certainly amongst all of us with myocardial bridges. As I hear from those conversations, and having recently had uh, Dr. Balky out of Chicago on, and certainly Dr. Boyd out of Stanford, two very different perspectives, one's sternotomy predominantly, one's robotic, you fall somewhere in between in the middle as the minimally invasive doctor and, and professor performing. Can you explain a little bit first about the invasive, the uh, minimally invasive procedure, yeah. and then secondly, why you segment yourself in that space? Okay, so um, the minimal invasive procedure means that we avoid median stenotomy. We avoid basically chopping the, the chest bone open. That's the main difference when you do minimal invasive. And minimal invasive mm-hmm. is a broad term that includes endoscopic also, that means guided by cameras, or robotic which means done by robots. Robotic, it's also a form of minimal invasive, truly very minimal invasive. We must understand that the premise in the treatment of myocardial bridge is the thorough unroofing. Now, whether you are a median stenotomy surgeon or a minimal invasive surgeon or a robotic surgeon, as long as you don't take any discounts and you do a proper unroofing on the arrested heart, I believe uh, you are good to go. So now the... Um, minimal invasive perhaps is a marriage of both worlds and gives you both the tactile feedback of the human own hands, the versatility of changing direction and going to the other artery as well, which the average robotic surgeon may not be able to give you. Um, And at the same time, it saves you the median stenotomy. As I said, the number one requirement, however, is to do a good job. Not every patient qualifies for a minimal invasive or robotic procedure. Every bridge is perhaps different. And every unroofing may end up being a slightly different procedure. So, and there are patients who don't qualify 
for a minimally invasive or robotic procedure. So in a way, minimally invasive, robotic, or median stenotomy, they are customizable solutions for the best interest of each and every individual patient. We just have them around quiver, and we pull out the right thing for the right person. We, and I personally, cover the entire spectrum. It may be any of those. And you will have heard that some of the patients I operated in Greece had to have a median stenotomy because they didn't qualify for minimal invasive. The myocardial bridge may have been very, very high up close to the aorta or the pulmonary artery. And this is something you don't want to risk trying to reach from a small keyhole on the side. Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. And I, I think it's important that our listeners know that uh, you speak with our other surgeons that we've actually had on the program, and you're yeah. familiar with them, Dr. Balky especially, uh, who is, is predominantly robotic. He works on a beating heart yeah. as opposed to yourself who arrests the heart, and Dr. Yeah. Boyd, I think, is predominantly arresting the heart. Um, what is it that helps you determine whether you're going to accept a patient or not accept a patient for unroofing surgery? Well, unfortunately, as we all know, there is little science because, uh, behind the causation uh, or, and, and the progress of myocardial bridging. Let's face it. So people around the world uh, have controversial views as uh, whether it's really a myocardial bridge, whether it's vasospasm, or what it is in the end of the day that causes the patient the symptoms. And accordingly, we take the uh, uh, appropriate approach. What I've learned is that when the heart is beating, and I've seen a lot of myocardial bridges, they can be so fine, so thin, almost invisible, just fibers crossing over the artery. And I believe the Stanford group goes, uh, you know, follows the similar principles, principles. So it can be so fine. I've seen too many doctors injuring the LED, the underlying coronary artery, when you try to do it, do it on the beating heart. So right up front, I learned to respect the myocardial bridge and go on it very, very thoroughly and rather conservatively in unroofing it, um, trying to unroof beyond the actual myocardial bridge well into the healthy area of the vessel. So, and I've seen so thin arteries, partially calcified arteries, arteries that you can easily destroy if you really don't pay attention or if the heart is beating. Now, uh, coming back to uh, our colleagues, particularly Sam, uh, Professor Husam Balki of Chicago, you know, there are many robotic surgeons out there, and I know Sam very well. I'm privileged to call him a friend. We're talking about potentially the top robotic cardiac surgeon on the planet, okay? So if there is somebody amongst those surgeons who believe to be able to unroof a myocardial bridge robotically, he's somebody who can land a helicopter on Everest, okay? So... <laughs> So uh, the normal rules perhaps don't apply for him, all right? I have the utmost res respect for Sam. But I do, having said that, uh, retain my own views that I've seen so versatile, uh, so diverse, so dangerous, and so thin and undiscoverable myocardial bridges that I'd rather give my, uh, uh, per, uh, you know, retain my own fingers super fine tactile feedback that a surgeon has which the robot may not give you, um, my, uh, my all due respect to the robotic surgeons out there. Um, and let's not forget that the way I've come to see myocardial bridges and started knowing and learning about this issue was from the medical legal point of view because I was senior reviewer in some court cases of arteries that were destroyed, myocardial bridges which were not unroofed properly, so that's what got my interest to study and understand this entity very, very well and see what is out there, do a thorough research and customize what for me is the adequate surgery for those patients. It's interesting that you say it was a court case that you got you interested in the myocardial bridge. Right. Same situation for Dr. Schnitger. Yeah. She was involved in a court case, had no understanding what it was, and she was... Right. Uh, uh, almost embarrassed because she didn't, because the attorney right. knew more about it than she did. And so that caused her to investigate, and she realized this is really a, a place right. we need to do a lot more research. Absolutely. And to this day, the disease is very often not objectifiable by the cardiologist. That means that they look at the controversial angiography, they look at 
eventually a CTCA scan, which looks like so and so. Uh, and they still cannot make a 100% diagnosis because the consequences are severe, right? The patient must go for surgery and all this. And then they put the patients on the treadmill and it doesn't show up. They do all kinds of IVUS tests and the usual half moon sign doesn't appear. And yet the patients are suffering from symptoms. So to this day, Jeff, we don't have clear guidelines as we do for bypass surgery or heart valve surgery. We have recommendations in form of a flow chart that tells us in this case, if the patient continues to have pain, severe pain, his life is compromised and medical therapy with the usual, you know, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, nitrates failed for six months at least, then the discussion is open for surgery. You just teed up three questions that I have to ask you. Yeah. The first one is, what is the process you use to identify the bridge for the patients that you're actually going to operate on? Yeah. So, well, um, uh, all the aforementioned, I would say. So um, the, the main diagnostic method is the uh, angiography, and there ideally the DFFR, which is a diastolic flow measurement of the vessel. We'll come to discuss a bit about the background of these examinations. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate having a CTA, a, a, a CT scan, a CT angiography that is then reformatted by the radiologist or cardiologist in a 3D fashion that has a high likelihood of showing you the course of the artery, not necessarily the bridge itself, but the very exact course of the artery. And indirectly, you get hints of where the bridge is or may be. Of course, the more you do like exercise tolerant tests, usually by the time I get to see a patient, the patients are so knowledgeable. They've been suffering for years. They have done all these tests. They've done all these tests, but this uh, latter mentioned test, for example, is very unstable. It may come, pos come out positive, it may turn out negative, but the patient still has a bridge and still has, still has symptoms. IVUS, which the Stanford um, uh, group is using, is also um, uh, can add uh, value to the diagnosis. But my last word on that is that many of those techniques are supplementary in the diagnosis. They may not be the diagnostic uh, test itself, which we 100% rely on. So the least I expect is to see the bridge in the angiography. That means you see the squeeze as the heart muscle squeezes and let's go. And then uh, the CTA scan, which will show me the geography within the chest and the arteries on the heart. So I can adapt the technique for the particular patient. On, on the CT scan, if I can ask, the ability to read that scan. Yeah. And I know Dr. Schnitger at Stanford really relies only on one or two particular professionals to read her yeah. diagnostics off those CTs. It is, I want to say, almost from a commonplace that we're seeing people, oh, I, that, that's a bridge, that's a bridge, that's a bridge. And I know it's causing some people concern on the Facebook group because they see it and they know what it's supposed to look like. And they see three or four or five of these on their CT but we're, we're not trained people. We don't yeah, know yeah. specifically what we're looking for. And I want to, yeah. you know, maybe get it from your perspective, from somebody who really knows what these are about, what to watch for and what to be careful not to be fooled by. Right. Well, first of all, I would uh, uh, discourage any of our friends on the uh, myocardial uh, breach Facebook group to make conclusions on their own. I would equally discourage them of panicking because uh, I'm watching the group, I'm part of the group, and there is so much panic. Yes. And on a lighthearted note, sometimes also a bit of nonsense, meaning that uh, patients are so confused and so stressed yes. that they project other problems uh, onto the heart and the myocardial or other symptoms that may be unrelated. And I feel so compelled to jump in and answer, you know, <laughs> to relieve them of their panic. But, you know, I must respect the PDPA, Patient Data Protection Act. Right. If I answer to your case, particularly, Jeff, that will trigger an avalanche of reactions from 2,000 patients who may right. not have what you have, and that is against my Hippocratic uh, uh, professional principles. So anyway, so I would discourage them to make conclusions for themselves. There are, in our profession, as in any other profession, there is a whole range of professionals. Some are experts in looking at the knee and telling you exactly what you have. 
there are cardiac CTA professionals who really have the eye, the expertise, and the 10,000 hours, so to speak, behind their back that can make better 3D reformations and better diagnosis of myocardial bridges. One of them is Dr. Kalifatidis, for example, in the St. Luke's uh, Hospital in Greece, where I'm unroofing some of the patients. One of the things that you mentioned in the conversation on the Zoom call was as you go through the process of unroofing and you are making that, that slight incision, I'm assuming very delicate incision with a lot of haptic feel, you also denerve. Yeah. And I think that was a new word for a lot of us. Can you right, explain right. what that means? Okay, I will start with a disclaimer, if you permit me, Jeff, that this Absolutely. theory of denervation is just a, 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 it doesn't have scientific foundation under it yet. It's just our theory in our team, because we often see that the myocardial bridge is very, very small. People target the myocardial bridge and roof the myocardial bridge, but then patients turn out retaining their symptoms. There is no difference. I'm sure you can tell there are hundreds or thousands out there who went through unroofing and their symptomatology remained the same. It's all for nothing, basically. So in our practice, as I said, in order to not miss any potential thin fibers that are crossing over, right from the beginning, I was unroofing all the way, basically over a long stretch of the LAD or any other uh, uh, vessel. And so then I realized how come our patients turn out to have almost excellent results? I mean, at some point we need to gather them and publish them with long follow-ups. And I realized that, and I did some thorough search, and I'm working with a university professor in Greece as well, and a larger team who are doing a thorough search. Now, there is a mechanism in the LAD and any coronary artery that um, is affected by the surface nerves on top of the artery. It's the outer layer of the artery. Those nerves can have impact on the constriction or the dilatation of the coronary artery. Usually what they do is they release a hormone, a substance, which is called acetylcholine. This acetylcholine infiltrates through the wall and causes impact on the endothelial cells. This is the inner lining of the, of the vessel and normally causes the vessel to constrict. Now, in myocardial bridge, there is enough literature out there that proves that that interaction is disturbed. And instead of causing dilatation of the vessel, it causes constriction of the vessel. Add on a second physiological impact, which we found. After the squeeze, there is a massive acceleration of the blood because of the squeeze. So it's like the Bernoulli effect in the pipe, in, the, in a vessel, you, you know the, the hose in your garden? If you, yes. if you press it at the, at the exit, then the water will jump farther away. So there is an acceleration of blood right after the bridge or at the middle of the bridge already, causing this blood to accelerate towards the, the end of the vessel. And so the branches, the preceding branches right after the bridge, don't get enough blood. So we call this a steel phenomenon, steel as in robbery, stealing. So mm -hmm. these two physiological phenomena seem to have an impact on the symptomatology um, as the bridge itself. So, and by unroofing thoroughly on the arrested heart all the way up and not just going desperately for a one centimeter bridge, seems to affect that denervation process. That means these nerves on the outer layer probably are cut or made dysfunctional in many cases, I do see the vessel beautifully blowing up, basically, becoming, becoming bigger and, and, and more round, you know? I, you mean immediately after you unroof it? Yes, immediately. And that quickly? Uh, yeah, uh, not in all wow. patients, but in many patients where this eventually takes effect. And in order to keep record of this, when I do my unroofings, I use a, an additional device call, called high-frequency uh, ultrasound. It's a me, the, 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 the market name, the branch name, uh, the brand name is Medistim. And it has a special epicardial probe, a, a little probe which you put on the vessel and you can see right under the surface of the heart. You can assess the artery. Uh, it's the Medistim Mira Q, Mira as in M I R A Q. 
and I'm using this before I start cutting and afterwards to compare before and after. So our quality assurance is there. It helps me guide and find the bridge, but it also shows me uh, the improvement on the flow right after that. Again, it's not always the same in every patient, but it's an additional guide. Well, and I'm sure that also gives you some sort of tangible evidence of change right. in that artery. Right, right. Because... And, right. And the, I think the, that... the, the actual, the most telling evidence, and sorry to interrupt you, Jeff, the, the most no, telling fine. evidence is the symptoms of the patients we'll see afterwards. Remember, unroofing a myocardial bridge may not result in immediate total relief of symptoms. It may be an ongoing process of recovery. In a certain percentage of patients, we're not sure, 20%, 30% may not experience a symptomatic relief. But what in our, in our patient group cohort, what basically uh, confirms that our strategy is perhaps right is the fact that the vast majority of our patients experience a symptomatic relief. If I can take just a little bit of a step back, because it's a question I've asked of all of our doctors, professors that we've had on, is we know that the condition causes a starvation of blood to the heart, which right. in some cases causes a myocardial infarction right. or even worse, you know, a full on heart attack with damage and everything else. I personally had a heart attack, uh, fortunately no damage, but it did cause an MI as, as much as we all hate to say, no, that wasn't, it was, we just yeah, had an yeah. incident, but is it possible uh, if, if the estimates are that there's 25 to 30% of the population, global population, just humanity, has a myocardial bridge of which a small, small percentage are symptomatic, we understand, but is it not possible that some of them may be asymptomatic until one time and they actually die? Well, uh, there is this uh, quote, there is nothing in medicine that there isn't there. So uh, that means... <laughs> <laughs> Everything is possible, in other words. We have seen all kinds of uh, borderline situations. But, Jeff, the reality is unlikely. We have to distinguish at this point a myocardial bridge, a true myocardial bridge with an element of vasospasm with a post-bridge acceleration. We must separate this from an intramyocardial cause of a vessel, which we surgeons see during the bypass surgery all the time. That means the, mm -hmm. the vessel gradually dives under a thin layer of muscle and then disappears. That's a very frequent situation. That's not mm -hmm. equal myocardial breach. So you are right, indeed, even of all those patients, you throw them in a pot, only a small percentage will have a symptomatic myocardial breach. Now, this, the myocardial breach, other than causing severe and debilitating symptoms, is also known to cause aerial, earlier onset of coronary artery disease. I mean, real atherosclerotic disease with blockages of the coronary arteries. In fact, in many of the patients I unroof, even though they are young people, I do see a premature thickening of the vessel wall, like the starting process of atherosclerosis, the true, you know, disease that causes bypass later, bypass surgery. Yes. Uh, right in front of the myocardial bridge. As for this, the, the muscle... Um, damage, the ischemia you mentioned. This is also the reason, because of the acceleration of the flow and the still phenomenon, you see, the LED is running right over the septum of the heart. The septum is the muscle that separates the left heart chamber and the right heart chamber. And there, the LED gives rise to a lot of small septal branches that feed this septum. So because of the acceleration, the blood doesn't have the time to go into those septal branches. So mm -hmm. what is the end muscle, the end organ that feeds from these branches? is your septum. And therefore, it bulges and because it, it swells, it's stunned for a little while. And this phenomenon, the septal stunning or the septal bulging is well described in myocardial bridge patients. So it's a temporary relative ischemia caused by the bridge. I think that's a wonderful explanation, and I, it leads me to believe that while the bridge directly isn't the cause of a potential heart attack, 
Right. But it could be the cause of another symptom it creates or another right. condition it creates. Right. And then right. it has to be be rectified or you could you could die from it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, very unlikely though. I mean, I haven't, it may have happened somewhere in the world where patients have not been followed up. Uh, from the myocardial bridge patients I know, nobody thankfully has died ever, but mm -hmm. there is a likelihood of a heart attack. There is also a likelihood that the coronary artery disease, which is a two degenerative disease of the vessel inner wall, will set on uh, earlier in life compared to, in quotation marks, normal patients. Yes, and our other doctors have explained the same situation yeah. where the artery thickens yeah. or occludes, could be both, where it enters that uh, right, right. You know, that heart right. for a variety of different reasons, and in some cases necessitates a bypass. Yeah. And certainly, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a, yeah. an incident or an issue where there's a, a problem there. Okay. You know, a lot of your cohorts and peers, uh, and I, I mean in the professional medical world, the greater professional medical world, not, not your cardiac thoracic surgeons, but cardiologists for sure still are not on board with these myocardial bridges. If you could say something to them as a result of your experience and what you've seen and what you've done so far, what could you say, what would you say to help move them along to better diagnose people right. who really are symptomatic, who are just being dismissed? Well, number one, take the patient seriously. The reason I joined this group is because I suffer with the patients, meaning that I see how much confusion and desperation is there. And the solution is an operation that, my goodness, takes 30 minutes. It's not a big deal for an experienced heart surgeon. So take the disease seriously and don't send the patients to the psychiatrist. I know hundreds of patients with myocardial bridge because the bridge itself is not objectifiable in the existing diagnostic methods, they are sent to psych psychiatrists. Definitely, mm -hmm. the patients may need some psychological consultation. Who wouldn't with a chronic condition? But uh, my advice is take them seriously. Number two advice would be study. Study deeply and understand the mechanism of this disease. And don't wait until the head drops off the shoulders of the patient to initiate definitive treatment, which is unroofing. Number three, regardless your background, whether you're a cardiologist, general surgeon, thoracic surgeon, cardiac surgeon, study the outcomes and results so far and don't go and offer the patient a bypass surgery or a stenting. I recommend against stenting. We don't need to turn a non-endothelial disease into an endothelial disease. I've seen also enough myocardial bridge patients who have been stented because they presented in some emergency department all the preceding diagnoses were ignored and the patient is sent in for stenting, which tends the young patient into a coronary artery patient. And then the stent broke. Yeah. And then they went in and put a bypass distally to the stent. So the right treatment for this disease is the proper extensive arrested heart and roofing and uh, uh, to, to address both the bridge and eventually vasospasm as good as we can. So educate yourselves. Take the time, that will be my last advice, take the time to, do, to, to talk to these patients. On average, again, on a cordial and lighthearted note for our audience, a normal consultation of a patient in my busy schedule takes me about 15 to 30 minutes. For a myocardial bridge patient, I take two hours. Because they happen to be educated, very clear about their condition, they have tons of questions, and... I, the doctor must take his time to address all those questions. E, it's even medically sound. So no question is left uncovered. No doubts. Well, and I applaud you for not only participating in the Facebook group, because that's one of the best sources and resources for people to get information. Uh, I'm sure that's causing some of the greater discussion because they're learning so much. And as a result of the participation in a program like this, where people really get to hear the doctors and the professors speak specifically about the condition, which, again, educates and they hear it in words versus other people's stories, that they actually start to begin to formulate the questions that are appropriate for themselves so they can better present it to their own cardiologists. Right. And I just can't thank you enough for that participation. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier, and we've seen it from, from the group, 
you now have a, a small cadre of Americans who have headed over to Greece to have the surgery performed. Right. And I, I don't know that we would call those, you know, destination surgeries or any sort of a vacation. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly much more for the, the cause and the concern of the condition. But do you have any idea or understanding how the insurance in these situations plays out? If somebody's leaving from the United States to come over to Greece to to get the care because they just can't find it in their right. particular city, it's going to cost them just as much to go across the country as it is to go across the uh, you know, the right. ocean. Right. Well, um, now I'm going to get slightly political, but I must be sincere to our audience and the, the, the myocardial breed group. As I said before, my practice is in Singapore. I had the department here in Singapore. So after COVID, however, Jeff, and that's the humane reality of it, my father got sick. We lost our father just three months ago. And so oh, I'm so sorry COVID, to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after COVID, I had to travel to Greece very frequently to ensure his uh, uh, home uh, nursing and uh, his treatment and all this and uh, whatever comes with that. So these visits had to be more frequent. Uh, I, had, uh, I went there since 2022, maybe 10 times. Now, whenever I go there, they know me in Greece. They know, actually, I'm an endoscopic and minimal invasive heart surgeon as my subspecialty. And so they grab me and say, can you give us a workshop or can we do a little conference or can you operate those VIPs and so forth? And that's how it started. So I didn't have any intention to go and operate there, coming from one of the top 10 universities in the world in Singapore. However, right. I was surprised, Jeff. I was surprised that this little two, three private hospitals in Greece, particularly the St. Luke's one, the level of care, it's a family business. It's an American funded foundation, basically. And um, uh, with an amazing team, high tech, you can't even imagine, and no waiting times. So whenever I go to Greece, I just simply thought that, look, all those American patients who have to wait for, I don't know how long to get a diagnostic scan done, you know? Months and months. And since I'm there, I guess it's easier for them to travel to Greece rather than travel to Singapore, which, the, which is the antipod of the planet for them. And Singapore is a very high tech, very advanced, but very, very expensive country. So let's talk a little bit. So it's easier and better to just cross the Atlantic, go to a beautiful Mediterranean environment. You literally stay in front of the waterfront and it, that contributes to the healing process. It's a bit of a burden to get on the plane and come over. But on the other hand, it's much, much cheaper for the insurance or the patient themselves. All of South Europe is ridiculously cheap. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but somewhere about the one-fifth to one-tenth of what an average American patient had to pay for his treatment in the United States or his insurance. Oh so that is a very, very important factor for those patients. So, and I do know from knowing the, the healthcare systems around the world all have their advantages and disadvantages. So in many ways, Greece ticks certain boxes that other places do not. And if the hospital itself, I know the CEO, I know the guys, they're all trained in the United States. They assure me that I can have the slot I need for the patient I'm bringing from the United States at the utmost high tech level uh, with a uh, family approach to it. They literally take you by the hand at the entrance and lead you to your single bed for a very reasonable total package. Then I said, okay, I'll do it. Well, the response has been, Exactly that, that they've been extremely well treated. They have been blown away by the service yeah. and the attention and the care that they got. So I, I, again, compliment you for doing that. That's a, it's just such a plus because this, you know, that weight is, is devastating sometimes for people. Right, right. If you went in mentally healthy, by the time you're getting tested, you're beginning to become unwell because you're anxious and you're not feeling well, you can't do anything and you don't know what's going to happen. The uncertainty is, right. is it's horrific. Right. You know, let's, let's take it just a, a little bit of a detour here. If we can, everybody likes to know what people do in their downtime. Yeah. And you guys are saving lives and you have an incredibly high pressure career and, yeah. and, and also an emotionally personal one, too, because I'm sure that there's patient interface that you want to do the best you can for that patient. So it, it just drains. I did have a chance to read a little bit in your bio some of the things you do, but I'd like to hear it from you. What, what do you do when you get a break 
and you actually get to go out and enjoy yourself? Well, um, unfortunately, Jeff, my downtime or break time or me time, as they say, is becoming shorter and shorter and more rare. I, so I would expect based on the yeah. stuff you're doing, I would absolutely expect that. Yeah. Now, nowadays, I'm a frequent to the United States as well because I'm starting a company. We're developing new endoscopic tools and uh, new heart valve implants. So I'm uh, frequently in uh, you know Minnesota as well as Irvine, California. But OK, what do I do? Um, I'm a pilot. I love flying airplanes. I have a Californian license. So um, that gives you a kick in a very short period of time, basically. Okay, so the, uh, the recovery effect is very, very intense, basically. Um, if you do something unnatural that engages all your senses. So I, taking a heavier than air vehicle and bringing it down safely um, is quite a feat, I thought. So I'm, I'm a private pilot, obviously. I love to fly in the United States as well. And the other hobby of mine is photography. That quietens you. You uh, uh, indulge, really. You force yourself to be silent. And you learn to see the way you should see without a camera. It sounds strange, but with a camera, you learn to see the way you should see when you're not carrying a camera. But what we do nowadays in our fast-paced life is we just go by, we look, but we don't really see around us. There's beauty everywhere. I, I can concur wholeheartedly because I was running at a pace pre-surgery, pre-condition, pre-symptom of just go, 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 go. Yeah. Until I couldn't. Yeah. And... Yeah. You make every deal in the world to say that if I get to stick around for a while, I will slow down and appreciate the things that I miss. Right. And when I go out and exercise now, it's not for the pace or the time yeah. or the win. It's for the pleasure and the experience. Right. And I'll stop and take pictures. I would never do that. Right. So I, I yeah. thank you for that. And I can appreciate that. Yeah. And on the, that flight now, you know, Irvine to Sacramento is close. So you are welcome anytime yeah. to take that flight to Sacramento and experience what we have here. And, you know, you're welcome on my, on my guest. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, the guess. flight to Sacramento from California, where I usually rent out is beautiful. You bus over these huge, very high antennas. You have just South uh, West of Sacramento. I don't know if you know oh, about them. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely know those antennas. Those are TV towers. Right. And but you also get to come from over the Sierras and Lake Tahoe, right. and right. it's spectacular. It's a spectacular checkpoint. And then uh, there's anecdotally, I once tried to take off from Sacramento, but I was so upset because I was put on hold waiting for the governor's airplane, Arnold Schwarzenegger, to take off. <laughs> and so that was a nice memory I have. Uh, I was in awe when he pulled ahead of me. <laughs> I think he pulled rank. Yeah. <laughs> if if somebody wants to get hold of you or your nurse Maria, what's the best process? How do they reach out to start a conversation? The best way is usually by email because, because then uh, they can uh, usually attach images, uh, CT scans, and geographies so we can have a uh, Zoom consultation for which I don't charge, by the way. Um, and so best is email. The most immediate first uh, uh, point of connection is uh, usually the, uh, uh, the messenger behind the, you know, there's this function under Facebook where you can send a message. Most of the patients mm -hmm. send me a message and then I encourage them to send me an email because I can't obviously disclose everything everywhere. I'm uh, using an email um, which I can have access to from everywhere in the world. So they shouldn't be waiting too long for my response. Okay, and is that email the one that I've been working with you on? Yeah, yeah. I can post that on the, on yeah, the yeah, show yeah. notes for Ab everybody. Absolutely. Wonderful. And now the good thing about the small boutique private hospitals in Greece is that waiting time is uh, is uh, basically zero. You get your that's time in two hours, there. not in two months. Yeah, that's just unheard of. Even to get a provocative test at this point is going to take you know three to six months in some cases, depending on where you're going. Right, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad to hear that, but this is the situation. This is where our advanced healthcare systems are going. Uh, probably we need a, uh, a reset there on a political mm -hmm. basis. Well, Professor Kofidis, I, I, I can't thank you enough. I think you shared so many things that not only reinforce, but also, 
brought some new next new explanations to the conversation that I hear so many people asking. And I think it's just a compounding effect. The more information we can get out there from competent, qualified professionals who really care about what's happening in the condition, it we just can't do it enough until we get 100%, 99, 98% of the cardiologists to at least right. be able to diagnose appropriately that this is a, a real condition. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we, uh, before we close? Well, I hope that our conversation today aids our patients and um, helps our patients further. Um, we're always at their disposals. A lot of doctors around the world who are able to help. My advice for the Facebook group is don't panic. This disease can be a chameleon. It changes colors and faces. In, in me, maybe different than in you, than in you, yourself, Jeff. So please don't panic and don't derive conclusions from yourself when you read the Facebook post of another patient. The most tempting thing for me is to engage in the discussion and resolve all the panic on the spot. But for the reasons I mentioned is I don't consider it, you know, ethically sound. But do reach out if you need any help. Thank you so much. And I think to your point, the novelty of humanity is the fact that we are all unique. We are individual and there are no two cases that are the same. So we have to take that into account, whether it's healing or symptom. And that couldn't have been stated any better coming from a source who has seen so much of it. Professor Kafidis, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Imperfect Heart. It's my hope that this information helped in some way to improve your situation or will help you better understand this condition. More importantly, that it gives you hope through stories that there is help and you most certainly are not alone. If you've been diagnosed with a myocardial bridge, please be sure to join the private Facebook group, Myocardial Bridge Support Group. For more information about our program or to reach me directly, visit the website, myimperfectheart.com. If you like what you heard today, please give a positive review, thumbs up, high five, or whatever your app likes. And be sure to share with everyone important to you so they understand what it is you're dealing with. Please subscribe as well. Welcome each day with gratitude and positivity. The views and opinions expressed in this program are solely those of the host and the guest and are not intended to provide, nor are they a suitable substitute for, professional care by a doctor, therapist, mental health professional, or other qualified medical professional. Imperfect Heart is a production of Hear Me Now Studio.